Our next presenter is Donna Wolf, and she is the founder and um, a trained facilitator of the Survivors of Suicide Support Group in Norfolk. And she has also started the Northeast um, Nebraska Youth Suicide Prevention Coalition. Um, Donna is going to talk a little bit about her own personal story of her son's bout with depression and his completion of suicide. And Donna's mission is to help break the stigma surrounding suicide, depression, mental illness, and help other families heal from the unfortunate realities of suicide. So please give Donna a warm welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is a suicide survivor. A lot of times that has two different meanings because a lot of times people hear survivor, they think of cancer survivor. They think of someone who has had cancer, they've lived through it, and they're dealing with it now. When we say suicide survivor, that means a totally different thing. A suicide survivor is someone who has been lost someone to suicide. And the picture that's going around now, a lot of people, I always show this. This is my son, Zebulon, 18 years old, March 1st of 09, he took his own life. I need everyone, I'm sending around a smaller picture of my son. You need to take a good look at that because that is the face of suicide. That is the face of depression. A lot of people think that someone who deals with depression and does complete suicide, oh, they have a gothic look to them, they come from a troubled home, broken home, this kid's really messed up. This person's really just, they're crazy. They kill themselves. They're crazy. No, take a good hard look. This is the face of suicide. Very, very popular kid. 18 years old, he was a senior at a parochial high school in Norfolk. He was captain of the football team. He was in speech and drama and band and track. He was loved by a lot of kids. He was the jokester. He made sure to make everybody else feel really good. But, as everybody knows of comedians, they can tell a good joke, but you know what? They're crying on the inside. He was really suffering from depression, big time. Um, with my son, Zeb, he had had a lot of losses in his life. Um, April of 08, I lost my mother to stage four lung cancer. This was his first grandparent that had ever died, and he did not deal well with her death at all. He was very, very close to my mother, and he pretty much said at her funeral, he goes, Mom, this really sucks. And I go, yeah, I know. I said, but you know what? Um, we're a very faith-based family. I had my kids in parochial school all the way from preschool up to high school, and I said, it's okay. I said, Grandma went to heaven, and I said, she's all good. She's with Jesus, and she's with God, and we're going to see her again, and it's all okay. And he goes, no, he goes, I'm never doing this again. He goes, I'm never going to watch another grandparent die. I go, well, what do you mean by that? He goes, I'm not doing this. He goes, I can't handle this. I can't, I can't do it. That was April of 08. He had a very serious girlfriend that he truly thought he was going to marry. And these kids get so, we're talking school age kids right now. We're at a school conference. So I'm going to try to base a lot of this concerning this is reality and he had a very serious girlfriend he truly thought that they were going to get married well she kind of saw his signs of depression and what he went through his ups and downs she broke up with him on february 14th of 09. why she chose valentine's day i have no idea two weeks later he completes suicide my son had attempted a year earlier so april of 08 he loses his grandmother, May of 08. I caught him with his first attempt at suicide. It was four o'clock in the morning. We lived in an old farmhouse, and <laughs> my husband at the time was snoring like crazy. So I went downstairs, all the bedrooms were upstairs, and I went downstairs to go sleep on the couch because I couldn't get any sleep. So I'm downstairs about four o'clock in the morning. Here comes Zeb, traipsing down the stairs. He gets, goes to the bathroom, gets a drink of water. And in our office was our gun cabinet. There again, we're a farming community. Um, how many are from Northeast Nebraska here? Please show a raise of hands. Nebraska is a very gun friendly state. Northeast Nebraska is very gun friendly. We raise our kids hunting and fishing. 
Um, they take hunter safety at a very early age. They're very comfortable around guns. Well, all of a sudden, I hear Zeb in the gun cabinet rattling around, and I flip on the light, and I go in there. I go, what are you doing, dude? And I said, you got school today. He looked at me, and his eyes were just glazed over, and he goes, well, me and the guys are going coon hunting. I go, what do you mean, you and the guys are going coon hunting? And they said, it's Wednesday. You got school in a couple hours. He said, give me that thing and go back to bed. Well, he went back to bed, and I, w I wake him up at 7 o'clock to go to school the next day, or just that day, and I go, what were you doing downstairs? I go, I couldn't sleep because your dad's snoring. I go, what were you doing down there? He goes, what are you talking about? He goes, I wasn't down here. He had no recollection at all that he had come downstairs and was getting in the gun cabinet. None. Didn't remember it at all. Like I said, his eyes were so glazed over, he had no clue what he was doing. Red flags went up for me all over the place. I took him to a counselor. He got a diagnosis of clinical depression and borderline schizophrenia. We got him on some medication, but I tell you what, this kid was bound and determined not to tell the truth to the counselors. He hated taking the medication, hated the way those meds made him feel, hated it. So there again, we lived on the farm, and he would purposely, I would make him show me that he took the pills in the morning, that he wasn't hiding it under his tongue, and that he swallowed it and everything. And he would go outside and purposely make himself throw up so the pills weren't in his system. And then I'd go outside and say, well, what's that on the ground? He goes, oh, the dog hacked something up. You know, he gets into something or whatever. And as a parent, I want to believe my kid. And at the counseling sessions, you got to know my son. He was a world-class actor. He went to state speech, and he was in drama. And I tell you what, this kid could get into character like that. He was the class clown. He made everybody laugh. He could tell a story like no other, and he could get into character. I swear he was another Robin Williams. Easy, easy. Well, there again, it's pretty easy to hide your pain that you got going inside of you when you can make other people laugh. So yeah, he would lie to these counselors, and the counselor, oh, it's good, and yeah, kind of trouble, but you know what, I got it under control. Taking the meds, it's all good. Well, he's lying to the counselor. So there again, he had four attempts before his final completion. First attempt truly was in the gun cabinet, and I stopped him. We got rid of the guns in the house. It's like, okay, I got him in a counselor. He's diagnosed as this, got him on meds. We need to take all the precautions that we need to. He tried to stab himself. He tried to electrocute himself. We had a three-story old farmhouse that it, uh, it had rain, tremendous rain. We don't get that now in Nebraska, but back then we used to get some rain. And one night it had torrential rain. He jumped off the th our three-story farmhouse thinking that that would kill himself also. He was so pissed off at himself because he didn't even break a bone. Just, just He's like, I can't even do this right. His self-esteem was almost nothing, but this kid was so talented and so smart, so charismatic, so good looking. You'd think he'd have the world, world. He had the world in his hands. He could do anything, but he suffered from depression. Now, we're here today talking about a really, really tough subject, and a lot of people are so afraid to say the word suicide. <gasps> it's whispered. We'll talk about it. We just, we don't really say it out loud. So I know y'all are teachers, so I'm going to make you use your voices, and everybody's going to say the word suicide at the count of three, because it's a scary word, and it's a scary topic, okay? And I don't want just your regular indoor voices. I know teachers know this. I want your outdoor voice on the count of three. One, two, three. Suicide. Awesome. You use your outdoor voice. All right. I'm a hairdresser by trait. I truly don't need this microphone. I talk all day long. <laughs> I'm very boisterous. I can talk very loudly. I'm very uh, animated. I talk with my hands. No, and I'm not part Jewish. I'm just, I'm very animated. So basically, I am here today to let you know I am a mother. That's all I am. I'm not a, I'm not a professional. I'm not a counselor. But you know what? I'm a mother. I'm a mother who lost a son to suicide, and I can say that, 
And I'm very happy that all of you said the word suicide because that's a scary thing. Depression is a very scary thing. Mental illness is a very scary thing. I'm here to hopefully educate you guys. You guys are teachers. Knowledge is power. Don't we teach that to our kids all the time? Knowledge is power. The more you educate yourself on something, the less ignorant you're going to be about it, and the less judgment is going to be made in this world. Every time I speak, ever since I lost my son, I can tell you what happened leading up to it. There again. He had all these attempts. I lost my mother. Like I said, she's only 69 years old, April of 08. I have lost my son, March of 09. My 25-year marriage ended December of 12. I lost my 22-year-old son-in-law to heat stroke, July of 11. I've had a lot of loss in my life. But I am here today to tell every single one of you, we all make choices in our life. We, just like Ira said, we can choose to let our events that happen to us in our life, we can choose to let us bring it down, or we can choose to make it a positive thing. I'm the type of person, I'm a very, very adamant, very outgoing, very uh, talkative person. I'm not the type of person to sit back and say, oh, poor me, I lost my son. Poor me, I lost my mom, I lost my son-in-law, I lost my marriage. What can I do with this? that has touched my life? What can I do to make a difference and to help somebody else? Because the day that I found, I found my son, I was traumatized by that. He used a youth rifle and shot himself. That beautiful face is gone. I had to witness that. The day that I found my son, I could not cry for a month. And I got such blame and such stigma and such finger pointing at me at my son's funeral. What a cold bitch of a woman that is. Look at her. She's not even crying over at her son's funeral. How horrible. What kind of mother is she? My ex-husband and I found my son together in our house. Basically, um, I got into counseling right away because I knew that I wasn't able to handle any of it. I was in total shock. My whole system like shut down. Because like I said, I couldn't cry for a whole month after, my, after finding my son. Well then after that month, ooh, the tears started. And boy, I couldn't stop. And you know, like I said, I got major judgment and stigma on me because of that, because I wasn't crying. Well then I start crying, well then I'm judged for that too. Look at her, what a mess. She can't keep herself together. First it's either she's not crying or now she's a total mess. Well, okay, I'm damned if I do and I'm damned if I don't, you know? I'm just, I lost a son. But you know what? People were so horrible to me at my son's visitation. And I truly, I've learned so much and I've educated myself so much on the happenings of suicide and depression and everything. People and community, and I don't blame y'all, but you say the stupidest things to us at when you're coming through the line. I had two elderly women there about in their 80s, and I can laugh about it now. They come up to me. Okay, I didn't have my son showing in a coffin because he's gone. I can't show him. I, he was captain of the football team, so I went to the school and I asked if I could get a football. And I had my son cremated and I put his ashes in the football. I said, he would love this. He would love it. Captain the football team. He just, he lived for football. So I had his ashes put in the football. And these two elderly women are coming through the line at the visitation. And they're whispering and they're just walking. And they come up to me and they go, well, now, honey, you do know your son's in hell, right? I'm like, I looked, and they're just, you know, about this tall. Because I got some heels on. I'm only 5'6 myself. But they're about four foot tall coming up to me, and I looked at them, and I was like, I put my hand up, and I go, I had to walk away, because I'm like, really? You're going to tell me that my kid's in hell? You know? Um, I couldn't believe it. And all of the other very cruel, hurtful things that were said to me because I wasn't crying at my son's funeral, and because it was a suicide. 
Nobody, if I would have lost my son to a car accident or if he had cancer, drowned, miscarried, stillborn, however we lose our children, you know what? I got treated horribly because my son ended his own life. Huge, huge. People are mean. Now we're talking school age kids. Now these poor kids, the friends of my son, these poor kids, I, I just went up to each and every one of them and I go, I am so sorry. And each and every one of those kids said, oh my God, we loved Zeb so much. His name was Zebulon, I called him Zebby. Everybody called him Zeb. Everybody loved this kid. Like I said, we're a very faith-filled family. Zebulon is one of the 12 tribes of Israel. These poor kids were in so much pain afterwards. And all I could do was hug them and say, you know what, it's not your fault. I went up to his girlfriend, she was a basket case, and I hugged her too, and I go, honey, I don't blame you, I don't blame the school, I don't blame anybody. This was his choice. We tried to help my son, he would not accept the help that was given to him. Like I said, he was lying to the counselors, he wouldn't take his medication. No matter what, people need to understand, like Ira said, I cannot make you live and I cannot make you die. I can only tell you that I'm here for you no matter what. That is the message that I need to let everybody know. We need a lot more Christian compassion in this world, a lot less judgment. You truly, if you, and I want to show hands right now too, who in here has been personally touched by a suicide, whether it be family member, friend, acquaintance? A show of hands, please. Wow. Huge. Who in here, you're all school people, who in here unfortunately has dealt with a student's suicide? Ooh, a lot. People, it's time to start talking the word suicide. It's a fact of life. It's been going on a long time since Judas. This isn't a new concept. But we need to start talking about it. There again, y'all are teachers. Don't we talk physical health in school? Isn't it usually about seventh grade? You get them kids in, uh, what is it, health class, and you're like, okay, you guys, it's time to use deodorant. It's time to shower. Shampoo your hair. You're stinking. We can't have you coming to class stinking. You guys are smelling. We gotta talk some physical health here, you know? Okay, the body has a hand. There's two sides to the hand. One side is the physical health. And we teach our kids in school, don't we? Physical health. You're stinking, clean up. You're gross, take care of yourself. On the other side of the hand, it's the same hand, but flip that hand over and you're talking mental health. How many of us really ask our kids, how are you doing? How's it going? But it's the same hand, but for some reason the school system really doesn't want to talk mental health with kids, because that's scary. Holy cow, what's going to happen if this kid really tells me what's going on? Now what? Oh crap, now i got to do something. Honestly, that's, it's a scary thing to talk about somebody's mental health, but honestly, if I go up to this woman in blue and she's a beautiful lady, if I see she's got a big open wound on her leg, flesh is hanging off, there's blood oozing out, bones sticking out, don't I go up, wouldn't each and every one of you go up to her and say, oh my God, are you okay? She's got a big open wound, bones hanging out, flesh is oozing, it's, you can see it. She needs help, we need to get her to the emergency room. But someone who suffers with mental health and depression, it's the very same thing. It's on the inside of their brain. We just can't see it. They're walking around in so much pain. They've got this big open wound inside their head. And they're in major pain, but we just we can't see it. If we could see it, you bet, we'd run up to that person, just like I was through that ball, and she was the girl hurting. Wouldn't we run up to her and help her? We would do everything possible to help that kid, or anybody. But that's the whole problem with mental health. A lot of times, too, there's stigma about medication because there again, these poor kids have ADD or ADHD. 
And it's like, oh, I can't, I need to take my meds, but the other kids are going to make fun of me in school. I just, you know, I'm going to be made fun of. I'm weird. I'm different. Well, you know what? How many people here need to take a pill every day for high blood pressure, high cholesterol, some kind of medical reason? Show of hands. Do people say anything to you about taking that pill on a regular basis for your medical issue? No, people usually don't because it's no big deal. Oh, that's okay. They need that pill because they got to take care of their cholesterol or whatever. But if it's a pill for mental illness, that's something totally different. And we need to stop that. The more we start telling these kids it's okay, you're okay. It's okay if you need to take a pill every day for this or that. And there again, yeah, I am going to talk about the topic of I suffered from PTSD very badly after finding my son. Like I said, I went into total shock. My body shut down. I couldn't cry for a whole month. Statistics are very high for survivors of suicide. The people that are left behind, we are at higher risk for suicide ourselves because of what we've been through. A loss is a loss. Whether you lose someone, grandma who's 98, or you lose a child in miscarriage, or in between a car accident or cancer. A loss is a loss. But for some reason, because I lost my son to suicide, I get treated differently. I'd be walking through Walmart, and I swear to God, people would be seeing me walking down the aisle, and they'd turn around and walk the other way, because they didn't want to have to deal with me. <gasps> There's that mom that didn't cry at the funeral. Get away from her. It's like I was walking around with a big scarlet A on me. People did not know what to say to me. They would not approach me. I felt like a leper in my own town. I am a working woman. I'm a hairdresser. I needed to go back to work right away. Four days after my son's death, after his funeral, I went back to work. And people are looking at me like, I'm nuts. What are you doing here? I go, would you let me be here? Would you let me do your hair? I've got to find some kind of normalcy back into my life. But there again, I got judged for that also because it's like, you shouldn't be here. It's like, no, I need to be here, but you don't want me here because I'm making you uncomfortable. We need to accept these families that have been touched by suicide. It's hard enough to deal with a loss in your life, but when you are compounded more with the death of a suicide, I'm telling you guys, it's a totally different animal. It really is. There is so much shame. There's so much guilt. Mothers, how many people are mothers in here? Come on, I want to see the hands. Do not we have enough guilt as it is? Now, come on. Moms are always blamed for this or that or whatever, right? It's always our fault. OK, throw, throw your kid's suicide on top of that, and then what? You want to talk about guilt. What did I do? What didn't I do? What did I say? What didn't I say? Just like Ira said, I felt like I was a total failure. I couldn't save my kid. He was hurting. My kid was in so much pain, but I couldn't help him. So here, here I get to live the rest of my life. I didn't see him graduate high school. I didn't get to see him go to college. I didn't get to see him get married. I'll never have grandkids from him. And that's a fact that I get to live with the rest of my life. And I get to deal with every day of watching other families that are whole and complete. I get to walk this journey every day of my life without him. I'm 47 years old now. <laughs> I'm a hairdresser by trade. Do you think I ever imagined myself standing in front of you people talking about suicide? Come on now. Never. Don't ever think that it can't touch your life because it can. I never imagined myself up here doing the work that I'm doing now. Like I said, I knew I had to make a positive out of this somehow. I took the training to become a facilitator of a support group. So once a month, the second Tuesday of each month at 7 p.m. at the First Baptist Church in Norfolk, I run the Survivors of Suicide Support Group. It's a peer group. There's no counselors. And believe me, 
Every single one of you in here can save a life. You don't have to be a professional counselor. I have bookmarks up on the table over there that talk about my support group. If you guys look, who grabbed a lifesaver? I want to know. Who snagged one? Awesome. <laughs> the reason I put lifesavers up there, each and every one of us are lifesavers, whether you realize it or not. You have the ability to save another person's life. All you need to do is what Ira said, be aware, pay attention. All of you are teachers. You interact with our kids way more than what parents do. Are you kidding me? My kid left for school at 6 o'clock every morning to go lift weights for football. And he wouldn't get done with football practice till 7, 8 o'clock at night. Are you kidding me? His world was at school. It wasn't at my house. You guys are on the front lines of these kids. Pay attention. And whether you realize it or not, your janitors, you need to go give them a big old hug because those janitors in those schools have more contact with these kids than anybody else. And those kids will talk to those janitors too. Because the janitors are the ones that are after school cleaning up and the kids are getting done with any kind of sports practice. And are you kidding me? Those janitors know all kinds of dirt. Talk to them. They can tell you all kinds of good stories. Make friends with your janitors. Give them a lot more credit than what you people do in your schools. Like I said, I never once blamed the school system at all for my son, but you know what? I truly think it does take a village to raise children now. So many people f are afraid. Oh my God, I can't get in their business. That's their business. I might see signs of another kid. But we're so afraid of getting in their business. Oh my God, I'm going to piss that parent off. I can't say nothing. They're going to hate me. Well, you know what? I wish somebody else would have seen something in my son and come to me and said, you know what, Mrs. Wolf? We're kind of worried about Zeb. We see something. Piss me off. Bring it to my attention. Talk. People need to talk more and look out for these kids. Don't be so afraid if you're going to upset the kid, if you're going to upset the parents. Are you kidding me? Two years on the anniversary date of my son's death, I got three messages on Facebook from Zeb's friends. Zeb told five kids the week before he completed suicide what he was going to do, when he was going to do it, how he was going to do it. Not one of these kids said a single word to anybody else. But yeah, there was a crisis team at school and they came and these kids are sitting around they're like, oh my God, Zeb told me, are you kidding? Zeb told me. Zeb told me too. Nobody said a word. Everybody stayed quiet. But two years after the anniversary date, they're talking to me on Facebook, leaving me messages saying, oh my God, Mrs. Wolf, we need to tell you something. We've just been so filled with guilt. We need to tell you. We need to tell you. This one poor girl lost 80 pounds. She can't hardly function. She's struggling. She's in pain because of the guilt that's eating her alive because her friend told her what was going to go on with him and she didn't do a single thing about it. I do a lot of speaking events now. I speak at schools. I speak to church youth groups. I speak to the noon Kiwana clubs. I speak to whoever will let me in. <laughs> let me in. I got something to say. Optimist clubs. Any, any place that will let me in, I'm talking. You bet I'm talking. It's time to stop the silence. We've got to start talking about this. The more you talk about this, the sooner you're going to get healed. Statistics show also that if a family that's been touched by suicide, if they reach out and start talking about the tragic, traumatic event that happened to them, within 45 days after the incident, that family is going to be healed so much faster than if they hide it in the closet. Because that's what our generation was taught and other generations. It's time to change that. We need to tell everybody, start talking. I swear to God, we can text and we can Facebook and we can tweet and we can do all kinds of stuff, but do we really talk to one another? No. Oh my God, did you see her hair? Did you see her clothes? But we don't talk to one another. If you truly just care about someone and you just ask, 
and just let them know that you care about them. It is amazing what can happen. Like I said, I've done tons of speaking events, and if you truly just reach out to another human being, Iris said it before too, don't be afraid to say that, are you suicidal? Nine times out of 10, they will melt. They will melt and they will admit it and say, yeah, I am thinking about it. Do you have a plan? Yeah, I do. Do you have the means? Means being a gun, a rope, knife, pills, whatever. They say, yeah, I got a stockpile of pills in my car right now. They will open up to you. Majority of people will because they're like, oh my God, somebody finally listened to me. Somebody finally heard me. Our society is so busy today. Everybody's sitting in front of their computers and they got this and that and everybody's lives are just crazy. We need to slow down and we need to check in with our kids. How are you doing? How's it going? Let's not be focused, and, so, and I know grades are important, sorry, I know teachers, you're all about gotta get good grades and everything, but you know what? Let's talk mental health too. How are you doing? Is it okay at home? Is it okay? And I am adamant about this too. These kids get way too involved with each other way too soon in school too. They're so serious and so in love. Just love, this is it. Yeah, sure. But you know what? Let's not, let's validate their feelings though. Because a lot of times that's the biggest issue with kids. They don't feel validated at all. Because a lot of times parents, we do take that attitude. Oh my God, there's plenty of fish in the sea. There's another one coming around the corner. It's okay. But you know what? To them, it's the whole world. Everything is just instantaneous with them. I've also learned that a child's brain is not fully functional. Their cognitive thinking, the frontal lobe of the brain, is not fully developed till the age of 25. We got these kids in college. Are you kidding me? We think they're grown adults and they're doing, you know, beer pong and they're doing their keg parties and everything. And we think they're really adults. And it's like, come on now. Their cognitive thinking isn't there. They truly aren't thinking through. Well, what's going to happen if I do this? What's, what's going to happen if I do this? They're, they, they, they truly don't know because their brain isn't fully developed yet. But for some reason, we want to we want to give these 21 year olds full credit. Yeah, he's good. Are you kidding me? He still don't know what he's talking about. You know, and there again, I'm sorry. I, I like video games just like the next person. But um, the video games now are so violent that these kids, oh, my soldier's dead. Press the reset button. Oh, look, he popped up. He's good. I don't think kids truly realize dead is dead. There's no coming back. There's no reset button. And when I go to these schools and talk to these kids, that's what I tell them. Dead is dead. Your friend's not coming back. You know what? If you would have told somebody that you overheard something, yeah, that friend might really hate you for right now. But five years from now, you can still go visit him and talk to him and joke around with him. Like I said, my son was borderline schizophrenia. He was hearing voices in his head. A week before he completed, he goes, Mom, he goes, make him just be quiet. I go, honey, what, what are you saying? I go, what are, what are these voices telling you? He goes, they're telling me to do some really bad things. I didn't know how to help my son. I know now. Hindsight 2020, I sure know now. That's why I'm here. I don't want any other parent to have to be in my support group. I don't want anybody else to walk my journey. I have to live the rest of my life with the fact that I don't get my son. I don't get to see him. I don't get to hug him. I don't get to kiss him. I don't get to smack him in the arm and say, quit being a jerk. I don't get to do any of that. I don't want another single parent to have to walk my journey ever. You guys, it's... it's the most traumatic, horrible thing you can ever imagine in your life. And like I said, thank God I knew enough to get myself some help because I was having horrible nightmares of what I saw. I don't ever want anybody to have to do that either. Those are horrific things to see. No one should have to see that. There is a reason why our soldiers are coming back from war and the rate of suicides among the military are rising because of what they're seeing. They can't handle it and they're struggling. 
And we need to help our military that are coming back. There again, I, I totally embrace anybody. I, I embrace anybody that's dealing with a child with depression, bipolar, schizophrenia, ADD, ADHD. These are real things. These are medically proven chemical imbalances in the brain. This isn't because he's a brat and he won't listen. It's an actual chemical imbalance in the brain. They're not doing it on purpose. They need some help. That's all it is. Post-traumatic stress disorder is horrible. The nightmares that I have for months are horrible. I truly don't want anyone else having to go through that. So like I said, I took the training to become a facilitator of the support group in Norfolk. And then I also, along with Andres Sandoval, and Andres, I want you to stand up a second. Andres has helped me also. It was myself and Andres, a pastor in Norfolk and a counselor. All four of us got together and we went to a meeting of the state coalition board with Dave. And the state coalition was having some seed grants. There was some grant money coming up. Whoever would be interested in their community, communities to start suicide awareness and prevention, there was money out there to be had. Well, you know what? There are four of us in Norfolk said, okay, now's the time. We need to get this out in the open. It's time to stop the stigma. It's time to start talking about this. I lost my son March of 09. May of 10 is when I started my support group. And we started our coalition and we've received probably over five $5,000 grants from the state coalition. We've done tons of work in Northeast Nebraska. Like I said, I go around and do a lot of speaking events, but we also do QPR training. Who, who in here has had QPR training in their schools? A few. Please know the state coalition or our little local, local coalition in Norfolk, we have the funds available, you guys. We're here. Use us. Invite us into your schools. Teachers in service day. I don't know what kind of meetings you guys have, but you know, as a hairdresser, ours are kind of fun. <laughs> It's a tough topic to talk about, but you know, QPR would be fantastic to bring into your schools for your staff. Use us as an in-service day. Use us, we're here, we're ready to go. QPR can save a life. Ask a question, save a life. Don't be afraid to ask the question. It's scary though, it is, because if you ask somebody, are you thinking of killing yourself? And this lady's like, yeah, I am. And then you're like, oh crap, now what? <laughs> I asked the question, now what? Well, how do you persuade them? How do you truly persuade somebody to get the help that they need? And is everybody truly aware of the resources available? That's part of our coalition also, and of the state coalition, you guys, use us. We have the resources available. We got all kinds of phone numbers. We got all kinds of websites. Knowledge is power. Use us. We're here. Are all you, who has um, SOS kits in their school, signs of suicide kits in their school? Quite a few. The ones that don't have them, there again, contact us. Use us. There are signs of suicide kits you can get in your school for free. We'll give them to you. You get to implement them any way you want. We're not Big Brother telling you how to do it but use them, implement them. Um, who has a school specialist in their school? Do y'all know what a school specialist is? Doesn't look like it. <laughs> school specialist is another thing that our coalition can help uh, get into your schools also. A school specialist is someone that is specifically trained in dealing with a suicidal kid or even afterward a suicide. Say you do have a suicidal kid. They're showing some signs and there again, you're going, oh crap, now what? I don't know, school counselor don't know what to do. We don't know what to do. School specialists, you call the school specialist. They're specifically trained in this. They know exactly the steps to take. Contact Dave, contact us. My bookmark is over there on the table. My email address and phone number are on that. I am available 24-7, you guys. There, 
I've kind of gotten to be known as the suicide lady in Northeast Nebraska. People know I go and speak everywhere to anybody about anything. It's like, I'm out in the open. Come on, let's talk. There have been three completed suicides in Northeast Nebraska in the month of March this year. Friends and family members have called me there again. They know I'm the suicide lady. They call me. They go, oh my God, there was another completed suicide. I know this family. You need to contact them. I go, you betcha. When, when can I call? I'll call them. The lost team that's been developed in Lancaster County, they have a specific team lined up that goes to, they ask the survivors, Would we have this team in place. Would you like the team to come to the house? We can come right now. We can come next week. We can come next month. We have resources available for you to help heal your family. When would you like us to come? Norfolk is really, we're really, really trying to get on board to get a lost team going in Norfolk. We're kind of struggling. But I'm kind of the lost team right now up there. People know to call me, and I will reach out to them. They can call me whenever I send out packets of information. I just got a call yesterday. A girl I used to work with that does nails in Omaha, she said her customer told her she's suicidal, told her she's going to take her 13-year-old son with her first. I'll kill him first, then I'll kill myself because I'm in a very abusive relationship and I don't want him left behind. And this girl's freaking out. She goes, well, how would you do it? She goes, well, I got a gun. I would just kill us both with the gun. She called me right away. Oh my God, I just heard something. What do I do? I know you're the person to ask. It's okay if I'm known as a suicide lady now. I'd love y'all to come do your hair. You know, I'm looking around the group. I'm like, oh, I got lots of clients here. <laughs> I'm a hairdresser by trait, but pretty much my mission work now is with suicide prevention and awareness. It's OK to talk about it. Everybody needs to know that there's a resource available to them. Even if it's some crazy hairdresser broad that you call up, call me. I'm here. Call the state coalition. I know there's people. The lost team. How many do you have on the lost team, Dave? 20. There's 20 people on that lost team at available that can help you. Do not feel alone in this. That's my main message when I speak to people. Don't feel like you're alone. The day I found my son, I felt like I was the only person in this entire world that has ever been touched by this. It's like, are you kidding? I just found my kid dead on the floor. Iris is totally right. My whole world turned inside out. Are you kidding? I'm, my life today is from the day that my son died, from the day before, and the day he died after. That's how I judge my life now. Not when he was five, not when I was 30. Nope, the day I found my son. That's how I live my life now. Cyberbullying, I do want to address this. Northeast Nebraska has a very bad cyberbullying issue going on right now. There's two schools that are horrific. I got two different phone calls from two different communities, very small towns. The cyberbullying, I don't know what your policy is in your schools, but you know what, you guys, we are the adults. We need to take the stance on this with cell phones in schools. You have no control over it when that kid leaves your school, and a lot of it does happen at night. That's when these kids are just nasty as all get out to one another. They're nasty, they're horrible. But you know what? We need to do whatever we can to protect our kids when they are in our schools. Whatever we need to do, there again, if we're pissing people off, we're pissing people off. Too bad, Mom. Too bad if you can't get a hold of Junior, because you know what? I grew up in an era, we didn't have cell phones. Car broke down, you start walking down the road. You don't call AAA, you start walking it, you start hoofing it. Are you kidding me? I'm old enough to say there was no remote on the TV either. You walked up to that baby and you turned the dial. <laughs> now, come on, I know y'all, there's some of you in here old enough to know that. The, other one, the younger ones are like, what? What's that about? It's a different era, you guys. We have to deal with all the technology now. I see a lot of people in here with tablets and pads. 
which is awesome, it's great, it's easier to take notes, but you know what, the fact is, as adults, we need to protect our kids as much as possible. You know what, we can do everything we can to help protect our kids, but the fact is, they still have the choice of what's gonna happen. And a lot, and the, I know we're talking schools, and we're, not, we're talking youth, but everybody needs to be realizing the fact also that white males, 65 and older, are very high at risk for suicide also. They get to the point of retirement, they feel like there's no purpose left in life. Or, oh my gosh, there's a health issue, and now they're a burden to their family. How many people are calling grandpa and checking on him? How many people still have a grandpa? How many people are truly checking on him? That's very hard for older men to get older in life. They truly lose their purpose. They're not the breadwinner anymore, and especially if there's health issues. There were, there were three completed suicides last year in Northeast Nebraska because of those exact issues. Now, I don't have a PowerPoint, but I bring a lot of things with me. Suicide is the third leading cause of death overall in the state of Nebraska and the second leading cause of death among 15 to 25 year olds in Nebraska. What's the number one cause of death? Car accidents. How many people truly know of one car accidents? Raise your hand. Are those really accidents or are those suicides? How do we know? We, we don't know for sure. All right, I got teachers in here. I love this part of my presentation. 25 attempts for each documented death. 34,000 suicides translates into 85,000 attempts annually in the state of Nebraska. In Northeast Nebraska in 2011, I personally know of 24 completed suicides. Okay, math people, where are you at? 25 times 24 is what? Cheat on your phones, I don't care. <laughs> How much? 600. 600? Is she right? Who cheated? Look on your phone. Is it 600? Okay, you guys, I just said 24 completed suicides. You just said 600. 600 attempts. Attempts. That's huge. And I'm talking a five county area in Northeast Nebraska. We're not talking Lincoln and Omaha, you guys. This is a five county area in Northeast Nebraska in 2011. That's telling me hugely that there needs to be a lot more talking going on. There's a lot of myths and suicides about, myths and facts about suicide. Suicidal people keep their plans to themselves, wrong. The fact is, most suicidal people communicate their intent sometime during the week preceding their attempt. Did I not just tell you guys my son told five people? They talk. It's because we're not listening. We're not being aware. We're not paying attention. The, most of the time, the signs are there. We need to wake up. Another myth, those who talk about suicide don't do it. Wrong. The fact is, people who talk about suicide may try or even complete an act of self-destruction. Self-destruction, that's exactly what it is. My birthday is March 2nd. My son completed on March 1st. You cannot believe the amount of people that said, oh, look, you're such a horrible mother. He did that on purpose to ruin your birthday. Lots of people said that to me. He's getting back at you. Look what he did. My ex and I found my son together. The very first thing that comes out of my ex's mouth is, oh, look what you did. Look what you pushed him to do. I go, you know, I don't think my fingerprints are anywhere on that gun. You can test that. I had a counselor tell me one time that basically there was a bomb that fell on my son's head and killed him. There's two soldiers that come upon the scene. My ex was first to walk in, I'm right behind him. Basically, when that bomb landed on my son, the shrapnel came and hit the first soldier on scene, and my ex instantly fell down to the ground and just was wailing his head off in hysterics. I'm the second soldier on scene. I see one soldier dead, I see another soldier wounded. 
I'm the third soldier on scene. I pick up the gun, and I'm here protecting everybody. That's why I shut down, and I couldn't cry for a month. I had to pick up the pieces. I had to make phone calls. I had to line stuff up. But because I did that, I got totally stigmatized and blamed and finger pointing at me. People react differently to death. People react differently to suicide. I was instantly pissed when I found my son. Instantly. I did not cry. I was pissed. I go, how dare you do that to yourself? How dare you do that to us? There's so many people that love you and you couldn't see it. Anger, shame, guilt, all of these are parts of loss, in any loss. But just because my anger came out first and I couldn't cry, I got huge stigma upon me. Another myth about suicide. Confronting a person about suicide will only make them angry and increase the risk of suicide. No. The fact is, asking someone directly about suicidal intent lowers their anxiety, opens up communication, and lowers the risk of an impulsive act. Impulsive act. We already talked about this. Teenagers are very, very impulsive. Their cognitive thinking is not there. And believe me, if you think that they thought of it just like today, wrong. A depressed person, they have that thought in the back of their head all the time. They're thinking about it. And it just takes a drop, like Ira said. Doesn't matter if it's the last drop, first drop, middle drop. One of those drops can bring that thought directly to the front, and it's right there. And it's going to happen. Kids are very, very impulsive, and they don't think through the consequences of what's going to happen afterwards. Another myth, only experts can prevent suicide. Wrong. The fact is, suicide prevention is everybody's business. Anyone can help prevent the tragedy of suicide, and it's tragic. It's traumatic. It's tragic. It's the most horrific thing you're ever going to live through. A lot of people have a lot of different crosses to bear in life. How about we be a lot more compassionate to what they've been through and not be quite so judgmental? Another myth. No one can stop suicide. It is inevitable. Wrong. The fact is, if people in a crisis get the help that they need, they will probably never be suicidal again. My son came to me after his third attempt, and he goes, Mom, I got a friend. Just, it's a girl, but it's just a friend. No big deal. But she's talking about killing herself. We need to help her. I go, OK, we're going we're gonna to call up the mom, and we're going to meet with her. We were able to save that girl's life, and she's doing awesome today. But you know what? That girl came to me at Zeb's visitation. She goes, what? I don't understand this. She goes, how could he help me, but I, he wouldn't save himself? I go, honey, I can't answer that. I don't know. He had so much compassion for other people, he just didn't think enough of himself. But people that are in crisis, it doesn't mean they have to die over it. I've talked to people that have attempted suicide. Majority of the people that have lived through an attempt to suicide, every single one of them have told me, you know what, I was pissed that I was alive. Dang it, it didn't work, and I'm still here. But you know what, they don't want to die. They truly don't. They want that pain to stop. That's all that they want. But they don't want to die. They don't. Another myth. Once a person decides to complete suicide, complete, thank you very much, I'm glad it was said today, so I, but I'm gonna say it again. Please don't use the word commit suicide. That's so horrible as a survivor. Do you know what that makes me feel like? When someone says, ooh, your kid committed suicide. No, he just had an attempt that was completed. That's all that was. Commit. He's not a criminal. It was not a criminal act. I'm sure, are you guys aware that way back when, if someone uh, killed himself by suicide, they weren't allowed to be buried in a cemetery? They had to be buried on the outside, on the outside gate of the cemetery. And the family was taxed even more because their family member killed himself. Isn't that great? Let's add, let's add some more punishment to the family because a person died by suicide. Yes? I have a friend who committed suicide, and they kept trying to place a marriage. So, I mean, 
the, the, did, did the church allow them to have a service? No. It, how sad is that? This poor family lost someone to suicide. They're trying to grieve their family member. Church won't let them come in. Cemetery won't let them come in. They're ostracized. Yeah, isn't that great? That's awesome. Yeah. But unfortunately today, that still happens. That's why I said, that's why I'm here today. We've got to change the attitude about this. These people, they didn't commit a crime. They were just hurting. That's all it was. So yeah, there again, suicide is very, very preventable. Like I said, I speak all over the place, and I personally know of three kids that I've helped save. They're still here today. They contact me all the time on Facebook. So would you know what to do if someone was talking openly about ending their life? Here are some verbal clues. I wish I were dead. I'm going to end it all. I won't be around much longer. I'm tired of life. I just can't go on. Who in here has heard someone say something like this? Ooh, lots of hands. Did you have enough guts to go up and say something to him? Oh, I see one lady shaking her head, yeah. It's scary to hear this stuff. Are you kidding me? That's scary. Because the majority of us don't want to face the fact like, oh, okay, they're having a bad day. I'm just going to keep going. I'm here to tell everybody, too, if you hear things like this, it's time to take it very serious. Don't act like they're just joking around. Because that's the biggest thing that I heard from the kids after my son's death. He was such a jokester, we truly thought he was joking around. We didn't think he was serious. It's like, well, what are you guys going to do now? Are you going to take it serious? Well, yeah. It's like, well, good. So how do you remember this warning signs of suicide? Is path warm? Ideation. Is someone really thinking a lot about suicide? Are they talking about it? Are these kids writing poems? Are they drawing? You guys are teachers. What are, what are your kids doing in class? Do you see their little doodles and stuff that they're drawing in their notebooks and stuff? Substance abuse. I'm sorry. Northeast Nebraska has a huge alcohol problem. Alcohol is a depressant. It adds in to suicide. Nebraska is a very rural community. A lot of these kids in small towns don't have anything else to do, so they're out partying and drinking on the weekends. And whether we want to admit it or not, little Johnny is doing a little meth, he's doing a little weed, he's doing a lot of stuff. Is everybody aware of the self-mutilating things kids are doing to themselves now, too? I would like some teachers in here, tell me some of the things you guys have seen with the, with the self-hurting things. Yeah. He'll take an eraser and erase until it just erases the skin. Eraser on the skin until it just erases the skin. What else are you guys seeing? Salt. What? Salt and ice. Salt and ice? What is that? It burns their skin and they put the salt on and it dries. And it burns it their skin. Burns. Salt and ice on the skin and it burns the skin. What else? stomach, places where you guys can't really see it. And they're, and they're using everything and anything, aren't they? What, what else are you guys seeing for self-hurting things? Yes? Branding. Branding. Hot. Hot metal. Yes. Mm -hmm. Anything else you guys are seeing? Self-tattooing. Are you teachers aware of the newest thing where they're cutting their knee right above the knee and shoving nails in right underneath the skin? And then when they're sitting in class, they push on that nail right above the knee because they, they would rather feel that pain, they'd rather feel that physical pain by the knee than they would this pain up here. 
I'm sorry, it's time, there again, knowledge is power, it's time to educate adults, get on YouTube, get on Google, Google self-mutilation. There's videos out there, and I'm sorry, there's videos out there that shows kids how to kill themselves also. It'll show kids exactly the amount of rope that they need. It'll tell the kids exactly how many pills they need. It tells them exactly the caliber of gun that they need. Like I said, it's time to wake up. It's time for parents to take action because there again, quit putting your head in the sand and acting like we're living back in the 1950s. Technology is out there. The kids know how to use it more than us. They're watching these things and they're learning. I didn't mean to shock y'all, but that's the newest thing I learned, because when I go and talk to these schools, the kids are telling me. They're the ones telling me, because they're, again, I'm so open, they're like, cool, I can tell her. I can tell her anything. Yeah, tell me. Talk to me. That's the newest thing. These kids are cutting their knee right above their knee and shoving nails under it so they can feel that pain more than the pain up here. It's time we get knowledge about what's going on with our kids. Where am I sitting for time, hon? Uh, it's 2 o'clock. 2 o'clock. Okay. I got a half an hour left. Basically, I want to open it up to questions. You guys are welcome to ask me anything. I'm very open about everything that happened with my son and what I've been doing afterwards. Any questions on anything? Yes. I have one older daughter. She was two years older than my son, so she is 24 now. And there again, like I said, she deals with her own depression. She's had a lot to deal with her life also. She lost her grandma in 08. She lost her brother in 09. Her parents are 25 years, divorced in 12 or 10. And then she lost her husband. Like I said, he died um, of heat stroke in July of 11. My son-in-law served a year in Iraq, came back from Iraq, and then dies at Fort Bragg of heat stroke. So, you know, never, never know what can happen in life. It's like, are you kidding me? He made it all the way through Iraq and made it back home, and then he dies of heat stroke down at Fort Bragg. So, yeah, my daughter struggles. She has her own issues that she deals with. And, yes, suicide is not hereditary, but I'm telling you what, depression is. Mental illness can be. The day after my son's funeral, of course, everybody knows the family gathers at the house, and it's just craziness after the day after the funeral. Everybody wants to come and bring food. I've never understood that. I'm sorry. Why are you trying to feed us food when we don't want to eat at all? I've never understood that. It's like, you know, bring toilet paper. That'd be better. <laughs> My house is full of people. We need extra toilet paper. I don't need another casserole. Are you kidding me? Come on. But yeah, at the day after my son's funeral, I find out that two nieces on my husband's side had completed twice also. I go, are you kidding me? This is very much genetic in the family, and right now I'm finding out about this? Are you kidding? If I would have known that there was a major genetic link of depression in that side of the family, holy cow, I would have been way more vigilant about, no, you're not going nowhere. You're sleeping with me or you're sleeping on the floor. I'm chaining you to me. But we can't. We can't chain our kids to us. You know, we just can't. Yeah. What are the, uh, you've got the 24 completions yeah. and the 600 attempts. Yeah. What is that age range? What demographic? They, they were all... A, Oh, I'm sorry. She, yep. She just asked if I had another child, and I said, yes, I have one older daughter who's 24 now. His question was, there were 24 completed suicides, which equaled out to 600 attempts. He was asking me what demographics or what age, what was the breakdown of the age. Honestly, they were across the board. They were across the board. We had a six-year-old on a reservation in Northeast Nebraska attempt in 2012. Now that is scary. A six-year-old and he attempted. And yeah, the, the ones that were completed, they were across the board from, uh, the majority were men, majority used guns, but it was across the board from, from, I think the youngest was 13, all the way up to 93. There was a 93-year-old lady that uh, asphyxiated herself. One of, the, one of the things that uh, us four right here, we work on the old Indian Reservation. Yes. In Northeast. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. 
Come on up. <laughs> Don't give me that mic, I'll keep going on. Here you go. <laughs> Come on up. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, didn't know I was going to address for you guys today. I thought I just, can I get my $60 back, please? <laughs> Well, well, well um, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Michael Grant. Thank you very much Hi, for being Michael. here. <laughs> and this is my boss, Jacinda Begay, um, our suicide prevention specialist, Jamie A. Strike out of Norfolk, and um, Richard Sheridan Jr. Uh, we work with a program called Project Hope um, out of off the Omaha Indian Reservation. Um, but one of the things that we found out is that um, when you're talking about the reservation stuff, the, the number, when we come to these things, we find out the numbers of the non-native communities that happen. Um, some of the numbers that we work with are a lot higher than mm -hmm. the state when, it, when you talk about per capita. Yep. Because on every reservation across, we call it Indian country, across Indian country, um, you're averaging anywhere between 54 to 57 attempts a year and half of those being completions. So when you talked about the six-year-old mm -hmm. uh, that was talking, that, that had attempted, it's not unfamiliar with us. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> one of the things that I was going to ask again was how successful is your adult program? Because one of the things that we've done is with our programming, we've been very successful in raising awareness with the age demographic of 10 to 18. But the 19 to 24 year olds, the adult, the transitional age, we weren't able to reach out to them as much because we're not in the school and those 19 to 24 year olds aren't in the school. So what <clears throat> Jacinda had directed me to do and we had worked our plan. We worked it, uh, got it to uh, develop a program that we call Next Step, and that's our adult component. And the reason why we developed it was the kids understand what's going on. Fortunately, our reservation, the Omaha Indian Reservation, our numbers aren't as high as other reservations, say you see in South Dakota, Montana, or even Alaska, Alaska, which has an extremely high attempt rate. Um, but we went ahead and we developed this program and we got it to the point where we developed partnerships with our social services programs, with our college, with various different programs where you see adults. And we went to them and we let them know that this is what's going on, this is what your kids know, this is what we're working on. We want you to know what they know. So that way, because when they leave school, I mean all of us, when we're, we work with them in the school, but when they leave school, where do they go? And I'm going to put you on the spot here. What did you know about suicide before your son? What did I know about suicide? All I knew is that it was a fact of life. And um, honestly, our, it was in a farming community. Our neighbor, a half a mile down the road, took his own life a, mile or a year before my son. That's what I knew about suicide. And that's it. That was it. Yeah. And so what we're doing is we worked with a program where we got all the GA clients, all of our uh, social service clients and stuff on a reservation. And so we do monthly programs with them. Um, we do our housing department with the clientele that are, is within the housing department on the tribe. We do quarterly programs with them and we're raising the awareness with them. And it's become somewhat successful because we've got a lot of the parents and a lot of the grandparents who are actually coming to us and talking to us and asking us about various different things. Um, I know I've been reached, I've been called late at night um, during my tenure with the program and I want to say that we're successful but with, I mean, when you have just one person with ideation, you still have a lot of work to do. And we just did a survey not too long ago and this will go to show you what reservations numbers can be like if you don't fight hard. Um, we did a survey of the age group that we work with the 10 to 24, but with the 10 to 18. And uh, it came back that 50% um, of those students, out of, I believe, 200 students, I think, close to 200 students, 50% of them showed signs of suicide ideation. And we're talking about a, a class D2 school, um, a community of maybe 800 or 1,000 people. So that's the type of stuff that we're working with. And so, but Project Hope, we're working very hard and trying to make sure that our programs go. I'm very glad that you're out there. And I like her because, Thanks. no, this is, this, is no, this, this is no disrespect to anybody, but I like her because of the simple fact that she's real. You know? Yeah, no PowerPoint with me. I just, yeah. 
<laughs> you wouldn't see this on the reservation. You'd, be, you'd probably see a white piece of paper with black markers. <laughs> But no, I mean, no, seriously. Yeah, and I I'm appreciate real. it. I thank you very much for that. Sure. I wanted to share that with you guys. That's what we've been doing. Um, we're working very hard. We're going into our sixth year. We're a grant, we're a grant funded program out of SAMHSA, out of Maryland. And so uh, we just recently got in touch with the individuals in the black. Um, and I forget your names. Dave. Dave and Jordan. the little guy, I know him. Jordan. He was <laughs> Jordan, yeah. Jordan. <laughs> Because we were when we went down, we came to Lincoln a couple in February, and we sat down and we introduced ourselves. But um, I guess since I'm up here, I'm gonna take an opportunity to say this to you guys: if you guys want to get a hold of us to come talk to us, and maybe if you'd like us to come hang out with you guys, please give us a call. Because now we're at the point now where we're not just doing things for our own, but we're we're trying to bring more people in, both across Indian country and across the United States. So. We've got a um, suicide prevention summit that we're putting together, and we're gonna um, we're hoping to have it in the end of July um, in Sioux City, Iowa, um, at Stony Creek Inn. And what this is is going to talk about uh, the programs and how each program that's been government funded got started. What are their ups and downs, and where do they want to go? But we want to share all of our information and give our information to the people that don't and the groups that don't have programs, so they know exactly what it is. Right now, it's <clears throat> it's uh, set at July tw July 29, 30, and 31st. Right now, at Stony Creek Inn in Sioux City, Iowa. It's a free summit. It's mainly geared towards American Indians, but like I said, we are wanting everybody involved. Because, like you said, everybody needs to get involved. It doesn't matter if you're white, doesn't matter if you're a beautiful American Indian man like myself. <laughs> Bottom line is that we need to work together to eliminate the whole issue. So thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you. And please know too, cultural differences, that's across the board also. It does not matter the color of skin. It does not matter the age. It does not matter the income bracket. Suicide can touch anywhere. Yes, ma'am. You talked about how the community responded to um, the situation. And the lady talked about how you had to found out that there was some suicide in your husband's family. Yes. How did your, your, your family respond in terms of like, the surrounding family, first of all? Second of all, how would you, in the future, if it were to happen again, how would you go back and kind of talk to your Um, the question was, is she addressed the issue that the community really wasn't the best towards me after my said suicide? And if I could go back and change it, what would I change? Holy cow, the biggest thing would be I really wish that there was a loss team in place when I had my son's suicide to have somebody call me and say, you know what? There's a team of people that have been through exactly what you're dealing with right now. Would you like them to come to the house? I would have loved that because there again, my family reacted horribly. I can easily say my one sister-in-law came to the house so drunk and so inebriated and I wasn't crying and she came up to me and she slapped me and she goes, this isn't the time to be angry. This is the time for tears. And I looked at her, I'm like, you can just take your drunk butt right out the door. I don't need you here because that's not helpful. <laughs> so yeah, what would I like different? I would have loved to have had a lost team in place or somebody like me that would have said, you know what, I've been there it's okay whatever you're doing is okay if you cry it's okay if you don't cry it's okay if you're angry that's okay everybody needs to take a chill pill everybody needs to calm down it's very chaotic it's a huge chaotic situation that's going on but honestly it's okay whatever you do is okay and if i would have had another advocate there that would have been on my side and said it's okay honey 
Everybody just needs, you go in your corner, you go in your corner, it's, it's okay. And honestly, I'm gonna bring one, up, one other topic up. I truly wish my pastor would have been more educated on suicide also. And I don't blame him a bit, but he admitted to me that was the very first suicide he'd ever had in his congregation. He truly didn't know how to handle it the best either. And I don't blame him at all. It's just that we need to educate our clergy and our pastors and everybody we need to educate them also. They need more QPR training also because they, they need to deal with the realistic part of the earthly part of it. Yes, you can tell me God caught him and he's great and good, but you know what? That's still not helping me right now, right here. Your question. Um, I'm not a teacher. I'm a crisis responder. Okay. Uh, You know, we never did get those, that part of the statistics. Her question was, uh, those 24 completed suicides, did we ever get information on whether there was alcohol or drug abuse or substance abuse involved, and then also whether, or where there was mental health issues in that, and no. And I'm sorry to tell you, these families will not admit also that their family member was struggling with mental illness because there again, oh my God, I have to admit that, that Uncle Bob was, he was struggling with antidepressants. Are you, that's a huge stigma thing too that they are not gonna admit. And I can honestly tell you, I've had family and I know this for a fact, they purposely have changed the death certificate too to make it be accidental death instead of suicide. And every, everyone needs to know also that a suicide is ruled homicide first until they can prove that it's suicide that's where that whole committed suicide thing comes into play because it is ruled homicide first before they can rule it suicide which i think there again yeah how great is that that helps me as a family member that's awesome that's awesome that you tell me that it's got to be ruled homicide before suicide that doesn't help me one bit yes ma'am How do, how do I respond to there's more suicides by gun than homicides? Um, honestly, the, there again, the fact of the matter is suicides are more prevalent than homicides. There are a lot more, and, and unfortunately, a lot of suicides aren't reported. Uh, because there again, you can only get statistics off what are reported because there again, I know of family members that have gone to the coroner and they have begged and pleaded and we'll pay and we'll do whatever you can do not to put suicide on that death certificate. Because there again, too many families are afraid of the life insurance. They're afraid that their life insurance won't pay because of its, if it's a suicide. So there again, there's another issue that the family gets to deal with after the fact. Awesome, she's giving me the wave. <laughs> One more. Yes. His question was, when I'm going around and talking to families, are the families admitting to the schools that these kids have mental issues? And unfortunately, no, they're not. Because there again, they are so afraid of the stigma. These parents are so afraid that if they admit that their kid is on antidepressants, they're gonna get treated differently, that they're gonna be ostracized. And like I said, that, tr that whole attitude needs to change. And yeah, it does start with the parents. The parents need to be brave enough and say, you know what, my kid needs high blood pressure pills, my kid needs antidepressants. Plain and simple, nothing else. But parents, parents are too afraid to say that because they are afraid that their kid is gonna get singled out. And then they're gonna get bullied and they're gonna get made fun of. Did that help? Yep, well, than getting and honestly, that's why I said I never, I never, I have never blamed anybody for my son's decision to end his own life. It was his and his alone, and the reason why went with him. 
I only I I beat myself up a little bit about the why for only so long because you know what that answer went with him. I don't know why. And like Ira said, it, there's a whole level, there's a whole bunch of reasons why. And you know what? That's why you cannot point a finger at anybody after a suicide. But I always end my sessions with letting everybody know. Yes, it was a horrible thing that happened to me. And you know what? I made the decision not to let it ruin me, just like Iris's poem. I give total credit to this woman. I heard her speak. I was so fortunate enough to hear her speak after my son's suicide. She changed my life. She's the one that lit the fire in me to make the decision to make something positive out of this. And I use her poem after each of my survivor groups I use her poem every single time to let everybody know, you know what, you don't have to like this at all. And you don't have to know why, but you know what, it is your decision as a survivor of suicide on what you're going to do with the rest of your life with it. So I give total credit to Iris and I love you, honey.